off. Uh, I'm talking about sweet objects, which are one of my favorite topics. But I want to start by zooming out and thinking about smart contract platforms and their value proposition from a tech perspective. Like, what do they do differently from what was available before? And then how does Sweet fit into all of this? So let's think for a second about conventional APIs, what we use to build the web, to build apps, to build basically anything today. Like, how do they work? So if we really want to oversimplify it, there's maybe three different pieces. There's a database. There's an API that gives you some view over the data in that database, maybe does some computation. And what the API does is it returns you a copy of something that's in the database. And then if you have a second API, the way it's going to work is it'll have its own database, it'll have its own set of functionality that it exposes, and it'll return its own copy of data. And so what I want to point out about this setup is that these separate APIs are always accessing separate DBs. And this also means they don't typically understand each other's data format. If I take data from one API and I try to pipe it into another one, it's probably not going to do anything. It'll return an error. There's no interoperability by default, only if the API providers decide to collaborate. And so let's contrast this with a smart contract platform. So in a smart contract API, um, you have a database, uh, as before. You have an API that exposes functionality over the database. And then what the API is going to return is not data, it could return data, but then it can also return objects that aren't just copies of things in the database. It's actually coins or NFTs, things that are moved out of the database and actually handed back to the caller of the API. And if you add a second API, it doesn't need to have its own database. It's actually going to share the same database as the existing API. And so what that means is, if you want, you can take an object turned by API 1, and you can pass it into API 2. You sort of get this rich interop by default. And so when I think about smart contract platforms and you know, what are they doing differently, it's really this setup that you have a shared database. You have these objects that are moved out of the database instead of copied. So that lets you do things that you couldn't do with a conventional API. And you get this interoperability by default. And I'm not saying that this is better than the existing setup. Both have their place. And they can also be used together. But really, when we think about what's compelling to build on SWE, what's compelling to build on smart contract platforms, I really like going back to the core value proposition and thinking about, like, what is this letting me do that I couldn't do before? What is this letting me do that I can do better than I could with a, with a conventional API? So let's take this picture, which is more general about smart contract platforms, and map it onto SWE. So objects, OK, obviously, these are SWE objects plus dynamic fields to link them together. These APIs are move packages that you publish. The interop happens via PTBs or programmable transaction blocks. And the DB, of course, is SWE, uh, and soon uh, WARS as well. And so in the rest of this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a little bit deeper into each of these components from a tech perspective. I think for longtime builders, you may be very familiar with these already, but hopefully it will give you a new way of thinking about how these fit together and sort of why they work the way they do. Um, for new builders, I think this is a great way to get introduced to some of the key concepts of SWE and how they matter from a developer perspective. And for the hardcore builders, too, I've got one slide of you in each section where I talk a little bit about what's coming next that's going to be for, for nerds only. And please come talk to me about that later. The things we're going to talk about are objects, which are this common vocabulary uh, that are used throughout the system by developers and also surface to users. I'm going to talk about dynamic fields, which are a, a feature that we use to bind data and objects together and to provide composability at that level. And we're going to talk about programmable transaction blocks, which are the, how we do code composability. So let's start off with objects. So in, in, in these Web3 APIs and smart contract APIs like I showed, like the thing that's different is you're getting back objects instead of data. And for pretty much any object or scarce thing that you'd want, there's some information and some functionality that's always going to be there. And so in SWE, we try to bake this stuff in and make it um, as native and as convenient as possible. So one thing is ownership. You know, if you're moving something out of the DB and giving it to someone, you have to know who that someone is. And you have to have access control permissions that are enforced on who's allowed to use it. You want this to be transferable. This is also one of the key value propositions. You can have an object, and then you can give it to someone else. Objects can own other objects. Uh, Client-side display. Once you have an object, you know, it should be shown in a wallet. It should be shown in an app. And you don't want to show some ugly JSON view. You want to show something that's really nice for folks to look at. And then also globally unique identifiers. We have to have some way to talk about objects and distinguish them from, from each other. And you get that for free in SWE as well. So we bake this into the system level, and then we expose it at the programming level. There's some example code on the right here. You see your globally unique identifier um, the plus the key ability. That's how you show that you're an object. This store ability is what you slap on an object if you'd like for it to be transferable. And then once you do that, you just call this function called transfer. It works the way you expect. You give it to an address. And then for display, you pass in an object, and you just um, 
write a little markup language that says, here's what I want my object to look like when it shows up in an app or shows up in a wallet. And so objects enable better code because they're a more direct representation of what developers are trying to do. So I think the most important thing that they do and that makes developers like Sui is there's this common vocabulary throughout the stack from the system level to the developer level all the way up to the user level. So if you're a developer, you create objects, transactions take objects as input, APIs read and write and return objects, and then if you're an app and an explorer and a wallet, you display objects. So there's no layers of indirection here. There's not like, oh, here's this code, but then here's, here's a view function that you have to call to show how to show it. There's not this, oh, you know, here's the, the data, but then transferability is separate. We try to make the gap between thought and code as small as possible and just have a really direct representation of what people intuitively want to do. So something else this gives you is really good security features. So if you look at the OWASP top 10 for smart contracts, or really for any, um, for any programming category, like one of the top five things is going to be missing access control checks. And so with native ownership information in objects, you get this for free. You can't forget the access control checks because the system does it for you. So this eliminates a ton of vulnerabilities uh, and just makes SWE a lot safer to use. And then finally, objects enable these really sophisticated standards like kiosk for royalty enforcement or sort of creative permissions, like closed loop tokens that like, give you a lot of control over the transferability of a token. Um, the native trans these are building on native transfers and ownership to enable things that are either impossible or just prohibitively difficult to do elsewhere. So here's the, here's the nerd slide. Uh, I'm, uh, this is what we've done so far, but uh, we've got a couple ideas of, for things we want to do next, and like, I, I want to hear what you all want and what sounds compelling or what we might be missing here. So one is equivocation safe owned objects. So a very common pattern in SWE is you, encode, you use a capability for access control, and if you're trying to access the capability from multiple threads, you can run into this equivocation issue. And so we're trying to introduce a new kind of own objects that can't encounter equivocation, which we think DeFi builders and other folks will like a lot. We have something we're working on called club objects, where instead of there being one address that owns an object, maybe there's multiple addresses that own it. There could be two, there could be three, there could be five. And so today you have a, this choice where it's one owner or it's shared and you have to set the policy for who can touch it. And club objects are a convenient way to encode this common scenario. You know, maybe for dollar cost averaging, the person whose funds it is can recall them or the, the system that's doing the DCA can do the dollar cost averaging but nothing else. Um, I, we think this will make it easier. Uh, another one that I'm especially excited about is package-owned objects, where instead of the owner being an address, it's the idea of a package. And to determine whether someone can use the object, you call a function, and basically you only get to use the object if that function returns true. So this could be a, a richer form of account abstraction. We already have many account abstraction features on SWE, but I think this is one where we really make it even more programmable. Good. So that's for objects. Let me talk a little bit about dynamic fields. So. Um, the programming metaphor I'd use here is like the stack versus the heap. Objects give you a stack. Dynamic fields are going to give you the heap. Of course, like you can do things on the stack, but when you want to have large collections, when you want to have trees, when you want to have big data structures, like that's when you're going to need the, the heap and the ability to create relationships between different pieces of data. And in SWE, like the, it has that usage and then also binding different objects together. So dynamic fields are useful for creating relationships between objects. At a technical level, what you can do is you can take an object and you can add or remove key value pairs to that object on the fly. So if we look at this code on the right, we've got our object, it's got a normal field, and then something you want to do, say, often in DeFi is you have a position object that has multiple di different currencies inside of it, and you don't know which currencies are going to be in advance, you just want to be able to add or remove them on the fly. So what this add coin thing, this add coin code is doing is it's leveraging dynamic fields to add a coin type to an object. So you say type name.get t to get a, a type value from, uh, from the type parameter passed to the function. And then you're calling add to bind a, a zero value coin to that function. And then the remove would work the same way. You get the type name and you can use that to look up the, the coin and remove it. And so this lets you do a bunch of different things. Uh, it lets objects be extensible. You can add in fields via a package upgrade, or you can even add them in external packages, which is an interesting piece of, of flexibility that folks use sometime. And you can add unlimited fields. Objects have a static field limit and a static size limit. With dynamic fields, you can have collections that are as large as you want. And the other thing with dynamic fields is, as the name implies, they can be loaded dynamically. Um, you, with objects, you have to specify what objects the transaction is going to touch, but if it's a dynamic field, as long as you know the key, you can load it at runtime, uh, which is really useful flexibility in some cases. So dynamic fields enable richer and more flexible objects. So collections like table, link table, um, anything you see in the SWE framework, these are using dynamic fields under the hood. 
You can have heterogeneous collections like bag that have values of different types inside of them. You can have extensible and upgradable objects, as I mentioned. Um, you declare your object, your contract's out there, and then two months later, you decide you need to add a field. You can use dynamic fields to do that. And then I think you'll hear a lot more from this from Brian and Kataro in the next talk, but from the product perspective, one of the things you get is composable object hierarchies. If you want an NFT with swappable accessories, a game character with an inventory, a DOM element that has recursive children, or as I mentioned, a multi-asset deposit in a, in a lending protocol. These are all use cases for dynamic fields and not just one level of dynamic fields, in some cases, but like rich trees that show objects that own other objects, which in turn own other objects, as deep as you need to go. Okay, here's the, the nerd slide for dynamic fields. So one thing that we've heard about a lot is display standard is great, but uh, it doesn't let you read dynamic fields, so we're working on fixing that. Something that I'd be curious to hear is, should we also make display let you read arbitrary objects, even if they're not connected to the object you're trying to display? Maybe that could be useful in some cases. Um, it means you couldn't call display from inside move code, only from an API, but it might be useful in some cases. And also for dynamic field reads, they're fast, but we'd like them to be even faster. Uh, at the system level, we're doing some perf work to make them reading these dynamic fields super fast. Okay, finally, let me talk about maybe uh, my favorite of all of these programmable transaction blocks or PTBs. What are PTBs? Um, in Sweep, uh, like in all blockchains, a transaction can call functions. Uh, usually, you call one function. In SWE, you can call up to 1,024 functions. Uh, that, that's a lot. So one thing that gives you out of the box is you get batching support for free. If you're a smart contract author, you never have to worry about like, oh, let me expose this normal API and also this batch API. PTBs let you, ha let you get that for free. Then the thing that gets even more powerful is you can do heterogeneous composition of different APIs that don't know about each other and don't expect each other, that sort of interop arrow I showed at the very beginning, using objects as glue. So you call package A, it returns you some objects, you then pipe those objects into package B, Maybe you then call package C and return some objects from the previous call and some from the, the second call. Really, you can stitch them together however you want as long as you're using strongly typed objects as this glue. And maybe one of the most important or subtle things about PTBs is you can build them dynamically on the client side, which is important because that's where developers are. Like uh, Publishing smart contracts happens, I think, an order of magnitude less often than building apps that are leveraging existing smart contracts. And the more you can do on the client side, the more developers can work in TypeScript, can work in Rust, can work in languages that they're comfortable and familiar with instead of having to write new smart contracts, even though we all love Move and love writing smart contracts. So here's some example uh, PTB code over here. I won't go too deep, but you see like, this is TypeScript code. These things like obligation entry, open obligation, each of these is invoking a move function. It's returning objects, and these just look like normal objects in TypeScript that I pass into the next function. And then at the end, I call sign and send block, which just is all, stitches it all together and sends the transaction. So the way I think about PTB is sort of conceptually is that they're solving the Expedia problem. So let's say you know I'm, I want to buy a Chicago to New York train ticket, and then I want to buy a hotel in New York, and then I'd like to buy a museum tour. And I only want to get the hotel and the tour if I manage to get the train ticket, because otherwise, yeah, I'm not going to be in, in New York to enjoy either of those things. And so something that's neat about PTBs is that they give you atomic composability. The whole PTB succeeds, uh, or if one thing fails, all of it fails. So you can try to purchase all three of them, and then if one fails, then the other two automatically fail. It just sort of does what you want. And then in terms of the, the vendors who would be providing these, they shouldn't need to integrate with each other. Like the, the vendor of train tickets shouldn't need to worry about hotels or museums. They should just be able to post their services um, and not implement any common interfaces. And then someone like an aggregator, the, the Expedia in this metaphor, should be able to say, hey, I'm going to bundle together some combination of vendors. I'm going to pick them on the fly for the customer or the query, depending on their preferences or what the prices are right now. And I don't want to have to ask permission from the vendors. So in this analogy, the vendor is just a move package that's providing some set of services, and the aggregator is just a PTB-powered app that's stitching together calls to those packages. And so I think one of the most concrete examples of this in the SWE ecosystem of today is the really powerful DEX aggregators that we have. So on the example on the right, like here's um, um, one transaction using a PTB sent by a DEX aggregator. This transaction is doing 13 hops across five liquidity sources, and it's splitting the input coin into seven different pieces. And so the thing I want to point out about this is it's really realizing this sort of vendor aggregator vision. Each of these vendors of swapping, you know, these are DEXs and order books. Um, they have their own APIs. They don't have to implement common standards or coordinate with each other. And the PTB is just using typed objects to glue these different calls together. 
This happens on the client side, so the brute finding algorithm can be very fancy. It can run in a back end. I've heard some teams are even using GPUs to do really, really fancy brute finding. And so what it's doing is like there's this on-chain contract that's providing a service, swap token A for token B, and then you have an app that does something much richer by gluing all of this together and combining you know, classical client-side computation with the, the smart contract computation via the PTBs. So you might look at that and think, well, you know, these DEX routers are a special case, or these aggregators are a special case. Uh, how often are other apps using PTBs? And I think that there's some interesting evidence showing that we're getting, developers are getting more and more sophisticated in terms of the kind of PTBs they're constructing. So here's a graph over time of the number of PTBs that have two or more commands. Uh, so it recently went up over 50% and it's climbing quite quickly. So people are using this composability power quite a lot. Another way to look at this might be how many PTBs are actually using two or more packages, like stitching together functionality that wasn't necessarily co-designed. And that's a little bit lower, but it's still gradually rising over time and you know, very consistently over 4% now. So I think as we see the interoperability and composability dream uh, coming true, we'll see both of these go up more and more. So finally, uh, the, the nerd slide, future thoughts on PTBs. So one thing we thought about is what we call fallible PTBs. It's cool that you have, it's I think the right default mode that when PTBs are all or nothing, that when one thing aborts, the, the whole thing aborts. But sometimes you want some section of the PTB where you say, you know, even if this aborts, I still want the rest of it to succeed. So one example is, a, say, like Aftermath's dynamic gas feature. Sometimes you want to do side payments on operations that may fail. Like for them, maybe they want to accept a payment in USDC and then try to do an NFT mint that might or might, fail, might, or might not fail. And they still want to get their side payment regardless of whether or not the minting fails because, you know, they're, they're doing the they're doing the work to pay for gas for this transaction. Or you might have several operations that may fail and you just want best effort, you know, try all of them. If one fails, it still goes along. We think fallible PTBs could help with that. Another one is uh, PTB commands returning references to input objects. This isn't there. Um, we think it affects people more. It sounds like maybe it doesn't. Uh, I want to hear from you all. How, is this something you run into? Do you want this? How would you like it to show up? And then finally, on more of the dev infra side, I think PTBs are a really valuable source of tests, especially integration tests and smoke tests. Like say you're producing an upgraded version of your package, like we should just be able to scrape all the PTBs that have hit that package, see if the new version of the package behaves in the same way, maybe do some mutation tests, just make it a lot easier to leverage this on-chain data to make sure that your code is correct. Okay, so I wanna return uh, back to this picture from the beginning uh, where Okay, we, we went through and we talked about PTBs, we talked about objects, we talked about dynamic fields. And now I wanna talk about, you know, there, there's two APIs in this picture. How do we maximize this? What's sort of the, what's the, the end game that we're looking for here with max composability? And so when I think about the utility of SWE or the utility of a smart contract generally, I think it's something, it's an equation involving something like the number of interesting objects times the number of useful APIs. And we can provide the tech underpinnings for doing this, but at the end of the day, like, these objects and APIs are gonna be defined by developers. And so really, like, in the beginning of SWE, we dream tech, uh, we dream developer experience, but now we dream developer success, builder success, seeing compelling apps just as much. And so I think there's a lot of developer momentum behind SWE. I like to say we have a, a small but fanatical community. We have the fastest growing L1 dev community that has at least 500 devs. We only have 5% of the market share of total crypto devs so far, but that's growing quickly. And I think um, because we have such great early builders and we have the, the good technical underpinnings, that's gonna continue to happen. So I'm really grateful to everyone who came out to the builder house. Uh, you all are make, or who makes we what it is. Please uh, come up and talk to me about the nerd stuff. Uh, ask me questions about objects and dynamic fields. I'm just really, really excited you're here. Thanks a lot.